Welcome to this third knowledge clip on subjects of international law. In this clip we will look more closely at international organizations and at individuals. First we will go into international organizations and look at their main features uh, to recognize what an international organization is. And in the part on individuals we will look at the development on how individuals became subjects of international law. First the international organizations. And perhaps you recognize the buildings um, which house some of the most known international organizations. And perhaps you recognize these logos of international organizations and you notice immediately that they apparently like the color blue. So what is an international organization? There are some main features um, by which you can recognize an international organization. First of all, they are being set up by and composed of states. They have um, a certain treaty which is made by the states through which they are being established. And in this treaty the main um, powers and duties of the international organizations are laid down. They have organs that are separate from uh, the member states and they are created under international law. And this distinguished them, uh, for example, uh, from uh, non-governmental organizations or NGOs who are uh, private organizations and from international corporations which are um, private companies that operate across borders. So the usual features of international organizations are that um, they are uh, open for membership and that the members are usually states. Um, although it can be a very limited membership, for example the EU uh, or NATO, which have a certain regional limit, or a universal membership like the UN. The treaty that establishes the international organization contains the powers and functions and tasks of the international organization. However, it is possible to, um, to acknowledge certain powers that are not within that treaty. Just because if you look closely at the tasks that an international organization needs to perform, there might be other powers that an international organization needs to perform that task, and that is called the implied powers doctrine. And also international organizations tend to develop. Uh, for example, the UN, which has become a very extended, elaborate system, uh, a system that was probably not foreseen by um, the states who set up the UN in 1945. There's also a legal personality, an international legal personality, that is separate from the member states. Um, that means that the international organization is a subject of international law by itself, and not only through the member states. And the international organization enjoys certain privileges and immunities. In um, one of the cases that was prescribed for this week, the advisory opinion by the ICJ on reparations for injuries, the question was asked whether the UN, as an international organization, could bring an international claim for reparation against a state. And why was that question so important? Well, perhaps you remember telling me in the first clip that uh, for a long time states were the only subjects of international law. So asking whether an international organization could act as a subject of international law was for that time quite unusual and very important. In this case, there is a certain division made, although it's not always very clear. Uh, and the division is that it can be asked whether a state has, or whether an international organization has a certain legal personality, and if so, what the content of that legal personality is. So what exactly the capacity is of that international organization. Because when um, an international organization receives its powers through the state, through the treaty that founds the international organization, the international organization does not have always the full range of all powers and obligations that you can imagine. After this advisory opinion, it was clear that international organizations uh, are subjects of international law and do possess international legal personality.
And what you see in uh, later treaties is that, that this is explicitly recognized. Um, check, for example, Article 4 of the Rome Statute. Now we move on to the individuals. That individuals are being seen as subjects of international law um, is also quite unusual when looking back at history. So states were the primary subjects of international law and the individuals were represented by their states on the international sphere. But through developments on uh, international humanitarian law, international criminal law, and international human rights law, we now see that subjects are, uh, that individuals are subjects of international law. First, we go back to the Battle of Solferino to il illustrate this. Uh, during this battle, um, there was a certain person who passed through, uh, and his name was Henri Dunant. And Henri Dunant witnessed the suffering of the soldiers that were just lying um, on the battlefield and left to die. And he founded, in the end, the Red Cross. And the Red Cross was the driving force behind many instruments on um, rules on armed conflicts, to make armed conflict as humane as possible. And we um, refer to that branch of law as international humanitarian law. Having rules on international uh, armed conflicts would also mean that you can violate that rule, with those rules. And we see that after the Second World War, uh, where people were tried, individuals were twi tried for their um, conduct during the Second World War. And this is quite unusual, because now there was individual criminal responsibility for acts committed during an armed conflict. And these individuals were tried before an international court based on rules that are considered international law. And we saw later, we saw um, probably more well-known examples of um, such courts. The, for example, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, and um, maybe most in the news today is the International Criminal Court for being criticized so much. Now we have the branch of human rights law. So human rights were already quite dominant during the time of the US Declaration of Independence and the French Revolution. And it acknowledged that people had certain um, freedoms. And these freedoms would protect people against their governments. And mainly during the Industrial Revolution, we saw that um, there should also be a certain minimum for people um, to exist. And these are the economic, social, and cultural rights. International human rights law took a big flight after the Second World War. And we now have a vast body of international human rights documents. And that will be the topic of uh, next week. <laughs>